uh, Jewish philosophy. And uh, last week we uh, began our series by looking at the first great uh, contributor really to the whole Jewish philosophic tradition. And that of course was Philo in the first century CE. And I just want to remind us, because it's very important to understand, uh, especially for those joining us for the first time today, but those who were with us last week, uh, and that is to remind ourselves that Jewish philosophy is effectively a reactive exercise. Uh, that is, that it is, uh, philosophy is the pursuit of things that we can know about the world through the mind and through reason and through logic. And the Jewish people who have relied for the most part on revelation, uh, how they can integrate those particular challenges that come from the general philosophic tradition. Uh, um, so that's important to remember about uh, uh, Judaism's uh, philosophic tradition being, uh, for the most part, a reactive one. We actually don't have any systematic philosophic contribution after Philo for nearly the next 800 years. We're going to open our chapter today in the middle of the, or in the early part of the 900s. And Philo is living in the early part of the first century. So there's nearly 800 years between them. And it's not like in that time that Jewish people weren't thinking about issues. It's not like they weren't busy. Uh, we uh, were producing the Talmud, two Talmuds in fact. Uh, Midrash, an entire genre of wisdom literature. We were the progenitor of two world religions. Uh, we were fighting a range of intellectual challenges from Christianity through Zoroastrianism, Gnosticism, Manichaeism, Neoplatonism. All of these things were occupying our mind, but there was no systematic attempt to sit down and try and write the uh, basic philosophic ideas behind Judaism. It just wasn't something that was challenging uh, the Jewish mind at that point intellectually. However, I don't know if you heard about it, but uh, uh, in the 7th century, the whole of world history really underwent a huge upheaval uh, with the rise of Islam. That's uh, not the total focus of our talk today, but it, uh, it does change a lot of things for the Jewish world, since the Jewish world was pretty much found itself at the center of the Islamic world. And uh, Muslim scholars, after uh, a while, I mean, in the middle of the 8th century, we see the rise of the Abbasid Caliphate and their emphasis on creating a culture of learning and of wisdom. As you famously know and learnt at school, it was the Arab uh, Islamic philosophers of the uh, 8th and 9th and 10th centuries who carried over all of the texts and learning from the Greek world, from the ancient, from antiquity, uh, the Greek philosophers and so on were translated into Arabic and they, whereas the West had kind of fallen into a dark angels, it was the Arab world that carried forward the light of learning, so to speak. And as you can imagine, after a while, Islamic, Islamic thinkers uh, are going, oh, well, you know, well, how do we sort this out? On the one hand, we've got all of these incredible truth realizations and mind realizations that come to us from the Greek philosophers. But on the other hand, we've got the Quran. We've got Allah, uh, who's given us this whole truth. How do these two truth systems match up? How can they be integrated? And so we see the rise of various Islamic philosophical schools, which like Jewish philosophy, were for the most part uh, reactive to uh, the consequences of philosophy, and we call those early schools of Islamic thought come under a, a broad name called Kalam. Kalam means that particular stage of Islamic philosophy where it was struggling with the issues reconciling the core revelations of Islam and all of this Greek philosophical thinking uh, that they were transmitting. Now, um, at some point, <laughs> at some point in the uh, in the ninth century, in the eight hundreds, uh, it soon becomes and and actually, uh, I'm I'm now going to share a graphic with you because I'm going to show you what we're going to talk about today for the next short while. Now, this this particular uh, graphic shows you what we're going to talk about today. This looks 
a bit probably overwhelming for some of you that are not familiar with the Gonic period. Now, those of you who sat with me for the class I did for the museum uh, on Monday, where we looked at this period in detail, or who've listened to my uh, course uh, recently, the three-part course in the Gonic period, will know what's going on here. But we're going to look today at the figure of Sa'aji Ga'on. And you can see where Sa'aji Ga'on fits uh, in the early part of the 10th century. He's sitting between uh, two of the last great Ge'onim, Amram Ga'on, who basically invented the Sidur, and Rav Hai Ga'on, who's regarded as the last of the great Ge'onim of this incredible period of the Ge'onim. And Sa'aji is sitting there. He's a contemporary with the great philosopher Al-Farabi, you can see that things are just about taking off in Spain. So we're kind of, Sura, the great academy in Babylonia, Sura has undergoing a revival. But uh, Sarge is kind of like its last uh, meteoric blast. And uh, I, we don't really have too much time to go into the biography of Sarge Gaon himself. Those of you who know a little bit about it will no doubt be impressed as Sarja was impressed as everybody since Sarja has been impressed basically a massive massive brain uh, born in Egypt and went to uh, Babylonia as a young man uh, or maybe 25 30 years old and as soon as he arrives there he's basically made uh, the Gaon of Sura which is would be a bit like someone rocking up at the age of 30 uh, to Oxford and suddenly being made the Chancellor of the University. Uh, someone who overwhelms this period with their intellectual projects. Just prior prior to um, the Saadja, uh, there were several major intellectual challenges that were prodding the Jewish people. On the one hand, the Kalam, which was uh, uh, making its own uh, progressions, the Kalam had basically got involved in the idea of apologetics on behalf of Islam uh, towards philosophy. But they were coming to Jewish thinkers and they were saying to them, well, look, uh, some of the things that you believe and that are written in your Torah and that are written in your Bible are not really philosophically tenable. And perhaps one of the most important of those is the fact that God in the Bible appears to have physical characteristics. God walks around, God has eyes, God has hands, and so on. Whereas in the Quran, uh, it's much easier to reconcile that philosophically because God is a much more reified and abstract and incorporeal idea. So these are some of the challenges that were coming from Islam towards Judaism. There were other intellectual challenges. Uh, during the times of the Geonim, we see the rise of the Karaite movement who were very insistent on reading the Torah literally. And we had challenges from people like Chiwi of Balchi, who were writing very critical and skeptical books about Jewish thought. So one of Sarge's main projects and one of the ones he's most famous for is the establishment of a systematic theology of Judaism, a systematic way in which he could make sense of all the fundamental principles of Judaism and how they could uh, appeal to the human mind. This might seem like something that we take for granted today, but Saadja was the first person to really lay this down in a systematic way in his famous book called Emunot Vedeot. And what identifies Saadja with the Kalam, and really he is effectively a, uh, a Kalam thinker. He's Jewish, but many of his ideas, many of the structures of his thoughts are borrowed from Islam. But make no mistake, for Sa'aja, uh, there was only really one source of truth, and that source of truth was the Torah. What he is trying to do is reground the whole of uh, religious thinking on a basis that is compatible with reason and with philosophy. Uh, he was born in Egypt, but he had studied philosophy under several uh, major teachers, both in Egypt and in the land of Israel, on his way to Babylonia. What identifies with, with the Kalam primarily, however, is the fact that the main discussion uh, in Sa'aj's philosophical writings, as it was for the Kalam, the main discussion of philosophy is God. And what Sa'aja identified as the key point of any religion's claim to knowledge 
is the concept of revelation. But can the unique revelation of Judaism be reconciled with philosophy? Can it be reconciled with what we call reason, uh, the products of the human mind? And for that purpose, uh, Saja wrote Emunot V'deot, the uh, the book, uh, the a uh, book of of beliefs and opinions, Kitab Bal Amanat Wal Irkadat and uh, in that book he does a very very important analysis that I'm going to spend a few minutes on now, but it has a lasting Jewish thought, and that is. Sanja sat down and said, at the end of the day, let's work out how do we know things? What is knowledge fundamentally comprised of? And he realized that there are two overarching ways in which we know things. One is through reason, and one is through tradition. And I'm going to share with you... Uh, what that means for Saja in a this particular graph right here. Now, reason for Saja involves three different modes of reason. One is sense input, so we know things from our senses. We see them, we feel them, we hear them, they happen to us, and that's one way in which we know things. The other is self-evident statements or truths, such as, you know, for example... Uh, um, truth is better than lies, or is, is a self-evident, uh, truth is better than falsehood, is a self-evident premise, especially if you're doing philosophical inquiry. And the other is logic, things that we work out via logistic syllogism and so on, and we arrive through a series of steps at logical outcomes. In contrast to that is the whole field of revelation. And revelation for Sa'aja doesn't just mean specifically the Torah as it's written, but it also includes all of the traditions that uh, that have come forth from Torah. And what uh, that, that would include all the oral law traditions, the Talmudic and so on. But let's just focus for the most part on the, Torah, the text of the Torah itself. So it's very important that we understand that Sa'aja breaks down knowledge into this two-part system because what Saji is going to do is he's going to show how these systems must be compatible in any project of reconciliation between philosophy and Judaism. In other words, to understand Judaism itself is to understand the importance of reason. And Sarge's a famous kind of axiom is that in the acceptance of anything, reason and revelation must accord. Clearly, Sarge's um, key point is to try and show how this fourth level of knowledge, which we call tradition, and that includes the revelation of the Torah. We could call it revelation. We can call it tradition because that's how we know about it. We know about it from tradition. This fourth level of knowledge. Saj's job is to make that reasonable. Not that we believe it simply because there's a great big thunder and light show and a revelation and we were told that that's what happened, therefore we must believe it, but that our belief system in that must be grounded in reason, the way that reason is grounded in revelation. It's not a vertical arrangement for Saj, it's a horizontal arrangement. These two must agree. And Sarge's project is to make tradition reasonable, to set it up on a firm basis. Now, one of the ways he does this in several ways, but one of the uh, important ways he does this is in relation to uh, the mitzvot and uh, the commandments of the Torah. And Sarge, for example, points out that a lot of the commandments of the Torah make sense on their own. They are reasonable. You know, don't kill, don't steal. Uh, those things are things the human mind could possibly arrive at by themselves. But there are many commandments which, where the reason is not apparent. But what Sa'aja wants us to do is to let to understand is that even those commandments of the Torah 
such as the laws of Kashrut, the laws of the dietary laws of the Torah, or many of the other ones that are not immediately accessible for reason, nevertheless have reasons behind them that the human mind is capable of understanding and that in fact it should attempt to understand based on reason. So Sa'ad just spends some of Emunot Vedeot in, um, in, in attempting to elaborate on what those reasons might be and how they can appeal uh, to logic. So, uh, and he goes through the Ten Commandments as an example of the kinds of commandments that can emerge from the different ways in which we know things through reason. And that is an interesting aspect of, of, of Sa'aj's thought. Uh, but that's not the one I'm going to focus on right now. But it is interesting because that whole tradition that happens after the 10th century, uh, where we're going to see that emerge in later thinkers, the attempt to uh, understand the commandments of the Torah on a rational basis, on a rational basis, not just on a revealed or blind obedience basis, really emerges from Sarge's distinction and his attempt to reconcile these two. Uh, but the real essence, the real engine of the book of, uh, of beliefs and opinions of uh, Sef and Emunot Vedeot is in relation to the topic of the various topics uh, to do with God. So on the one hand, uh, Saja is going into the concept of divine uniqueness. What does it mean? What are all of these descriptions in the Torah about God? What are they actually doing there? And here's, here's probably Sarge's key, key contribution. And it is to realize and to explain that, and I don't want anybody running out of the room when I say this, because it's a very, very shocking thought to a lot of people, that the Torah is not literal. The Torah is not a literal document it can be interpreted allegorically and we know that says Sa'aja because when the Torah talks about the eyes of God or the hands of God it cannot be literal because I have on the one hand a traditional notion that God is incorporeal God does not have a body but I also have an idea about that which conforms with reason. And Sa'aja explains to you, none of Aristotle's character categories can apply to God. None of the incidentals or accidents that happen in relation to created things can be applied to God. God to God of necessity cannot have a body. These descriptions are modes of divine interaction. So when we talk about the hands of God, we talk, or the arm of God, we're talking about the strength of God, we talk about the eyes of God, we talk about the supervision of God on the world, but they are just descriptives of modes of interaction. They cannot be applied to God, uh, to God himself. God itself is beyond our understanding. Now, uh, one of the issues that therefore comes out from there, and, and, and um, I'm just going to touch on this, it's a complex subject, I don't want to confuse people, but you, know, you could ask, well, how do we know that the tradition that we've got is the right tradition? And Saad just spends quite some time on this because uh, he relies on the prophets of Israel who have transmitted the tradition as having had a unique type of perception uh, and which Saja calls uh, their ability to perceive these modes of divine interaction through a mechanism called the Kavod. And I'm going to show you a diagram of the Kavod and you'll realize, I mean, I, I made this last night. I know it's not perfect, but um, you'll realize that uh, and you'll realize that what, what the Kavod looks like and the Kavod means the glory and it looks very similar to something we've seen before with Philo, who talked about the Logos. The Kavod speaks directly to the mind of the prophet in order to clarify what is true knowledge. There's many types of knowledge, but true knowledge 
uh, of the divine is vouchsafed through the kavod, which is going to become a mechanism of Jewish medieval thought because we need to understand why it is that the prophets of Israel were able to have this unique perception of the modes of God. But Sarge spends time explaining that. But the key point I want us to understand from this is the idea of allegory, that things are not necessarily literal. And I'm going to say another controversial point, and I'll say this now, is that I think if Sarge was around today, I don't think that he would have any problem with something like the theory of, of evolution, for example. He would tell you, he would tell you that if all of the scientific and logical and rational and reasonable evidence is pointing in a certain direction, and the Torah's description of creation doesn't seem to accord with reason, but it can be understood allegorically, then you understand it allegorically. It's not going to help anyone if you hold on to a blind, literal faith in what the Torah says if it conflicts with reason. And we saw this, we saw this with the descriptions of God's modes and all of the divine interactions and processes. So I don't think that there would be that kind of conflict that some people experience today between the Torah and science would not be an issue for Sa'aja. It's an issue for people today. And when it comes to creation, uh, Sa'aja takes on board the, uh, most of the arguments of the, of the Mutazalites, of the Kalam. He talks about the, the proofs of God, the usual proofs of the teleological argument from the Talmud about how if the world looks created, so there must have been a creator. But he also emphatically, emphatically stresses that the world is created from nothing. Remember from last week, we talked about the, for Plato and for even for Philo, it's possible that the world was created from pre-existent uh, matter, but uh, under no circumstances for Sa'aja. And this is something that uh, Sa'aja Gaon establishes as an almost immovable pillar of subsequent Jewish philosophy, the concept of yesh me'ayin, the concept of the fact that the world and even time itself is created from nothing uh, by God. And uh, I'll Ultimately, also, Sarja is emphatic and lays down the paradigm for the future on the importance of uh, free will. And that is that free will is something that you have. The conflict that's going to become very big in the Middle Ages about how do you have free will when God knows everything, not a problem for Sarja. He's aware of the argument, but he says God has foreknowledge of everything, but God's foreknowledge. Uh, does not choose what you do. You choose what you do, uh, not uh, God's foreknowledge. He has it, but this is a, not a terribly satisfying answer to that question, but Saja is aware of the question and lays down that whichever way you're going to approach it, you cannot deviate from the fact that you have free will. And why do you have free will? You have to have free will because otherwise there's no point. The commandments were given to people and both rational commandments and even commandments that you can't yet understand with your reason were given. You're going to get reward for all of them. They're important to do because human beings need to earn their own reward in this world. And there would be absolutely no point to that if you did not have free choice. This very, very fundamental idea of Jewish theology laid down by Sa'aja in this systematic contribution. Um, the other thing that Sarja talks about and, um, <laughs> and is really the first to talk about in a systematic way is the concept of the soul. Uh, we know that uh, already Plato had talked about the soul um, and there are three levels to the soul basically coming out of Platonic thought. There is your... Uh, your appetitive soul, in other words, that's the soul that goes around doing things that require um, just basic uh, appetites, you know, whether they are for food or other things. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the soul that wanders around uh, shopping centers and so on. 
And then you've got the emotive soul, uh, that's the passions and uh, all of your different aspects, whether it's uh, uh, courage or, or, or anger or love, and all of those things uh, exist within your emotional framework. And then, of course, your soul has an intellectual faculty. This tripartite, this threefold division of the soul, is something that Sa'aja picks up on because he finds an exact corollary in Jewish thought in the notion of the three modes that we talk about the soul of nefesh, ruach, and neshama, the three terms that the Torah uses for the concept of soul as it is evolving in, 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 the, in the biblical literature. And Sa'aja takes those and welds them to Plato's notion of the three parts of the soul. This is going to be immensely important going forward. It's going to have huge uh, effect on, on Kabbalistic thinking as well as Jewish philosophic thinking, so it's important. But Sarja, in any discussion about the soul, as with anything else, says it must accord with reason. For that, for that, Sarja, for example, rejects the concept of reincarnation. Reincarnation doesn't make sense for Sarja. Uh, reincarnation is going to come back into Jewish thought in Kabbalistic thinking in a big way. Reincarnation is a part of Jewish thought. But for a rationalist like Sarja Gaon, living in the 10th century in the Abbasid Caliphate, he's not into reincarnation. It doesn't make sense to him. What he is, however, emphatic about is the concept of the resurrection of the dead. Uh, and that is at the end of days, uh, everybody is going to uh, be brought back to life. And Sarja makes this argument uh, based on his argument about yesh me'ayin, his argument about something from nothing. Uh, because if God is capable of creating the world from nothing, then it's a, then the problem of creating something that has already existed is not going to be an issue. It's much more difficult to create something that has never existed than something that has already previously existed. Uh, so he takes these foundational Jewish concepts, the idea of the resurrection of the dead as an essential belief of Judaism had already been discussed by the Talmud. So Sarja can't reject that, but what he does is he takes that concept and he grounds it on reason. And therefore, let's just, to summarize again, the major contributions of Sa'aj Gaon. And I know I've, I've gone through them very, very quickly, so I just want to go over them again. And that is that there is knowledge that we acquire through reason, and there is knowledge that we acquire, acquire through tradition. And those two things must accord, if I'm to accept them, as part of the way I see the world. It doesn't mean... It doesn't mean I can reject things I don't understand. If I'm told by revelation or tradition about certain things and I don't understand them, that just means I do not yet understand them. But Sarja tells you, you can. There is a pathway of reason that leads to the understanding of everything in tradition. So the fact that you can't understand it doesn't mean we reject it. But if it conflicts with reason, if it conflicts with logic, such as, for example, what I was talking about before, the idea of reincarnation. Sarge's basic problem with reincarnation, by the way, was that he seems to be very concerned with when he wakes up at the end of days and the resurrection of the dead, uh, uh, who are you going to be married to? Seems to be a big problem for him. Uh, not just that, but uh, then you've got the other problem of uh, exactly who are you? Uh, so he... He rejects that because he doesn't have to accept it because it conflicts with his reason. Uh, we talked about the fact that reason and uh, revelation must accord. We talked about the fact that uh, tradition, tradition is a guiding force. Maybe I didn't talk about it. Tradition is a guiding force for reason. So, uh, because people could say, well, why did you need to put all those different types of commandments, the ones that we can understand through reason, the one we can't understand through reason, why did God put them all in the same document? Sarge would argue, because one guides the other. 
tradition guides reason. It keeps it grounded in the a proper perspective on the world. And at the same time, it, uh, it allows us to move progressively from things that we can understand <clears throat> to things that we can't yet, but we accept from tradition. Tradition is also reasonable because, as Sarja argues extensively, because of the way it's transmitted. And that is where, uh, that's where Judaism does its job very, very well because of the uh, historical dimension of Judaism that has allowed uh, for these things to be transmitted throughout history. We talked about the notion of the kavod. The kavod, which is going to figure big in Jewish philosophy, is the transmitter of true knowledge that comes to the prophets of Israel so that they can discern that the knowledge that they are acquiring in order to express the modes of divine interaction with the world are correct. So you can see that in every single facet of Jewish thinking, Sanju is not just going, oh, I've got to believe this because I'm told it by the Torah or because I'm told it by the Talmud. He's putting everything through this uh, mill of uh, philosophy and reason to try and explain why it, it makes logic sense. I mean, I should, I should point out um, to those uh, who are uh, wondering that, of course, um, many of the arguments of the Kalam, uh, and we can include Sa'aje in the, the broad category of Kalam thinkers who are in this, at this particular time, in the, eighth, in the 9th and 10th centuries, trying to take revealed religion and set it on a groundwork of reason, uh, mostly for the purposes of apologetics, because Sarge's basic project is to resolve Judaism with its intellectual challenges, so that whether that is with Islam or whether that is uh, with uh, the accusations that are coming from elsewhere in the Jewish world, then we have to realize that uh, many of those presuppositions of, of the Kalam were completely uh, destroyed uh, in the uh, even even during Sarge's time. Sarge, as I showed you, is a uh, Sarge is a contemporary of uh, Al Farabi, and Al Farabi is really a very different type of philosopher uh, who is not necessarily using God as his initial premise, but in fact the whole notion of being in the world is much more similar to later Aristotelian philosophies, and he's destroying uh, a lot of the Kalam arguments uh, for reasons that I'm not going to go into now, obviously. Uh, but we should also be aware that, uh, with great respect, a lot of Sarge's philosophy was deconstructed by the Rambam, by Maimonides, uh, a couple of centuries later, who doesn't really talk about Sa'aja so much by name, but that type of thinking, uh, which is grounded in uh, apologetics. Uh, and one of the main, one of the great problems with it is that it can be applied to any religion and that it doesn't, uh, it, 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 and it also is based because by, by the time you get to Maimonides, you've already gone through another couple of centuries of philosophical development and many of the ideas of Greek philosophy are starting to be weeded out. While when Sarge is sitting reading philosophy, he's not reading philosophy that, uh, when he's reading Aristotle, for example, he's not really reading Aristotle. He's actually reading a cholent uh, of Aristotle and Plato and Neoplatonic thinking the whole project of sorting out what exactly was Aristotle saying and that massive difference that we're now aware of uh, is in evol is even evolution over the next couple of centuries. So Maimonides, the Rambam is coming from a far, in a way, more advanced and sophisticated philosophical position than Sarger was. But even Maimonides acknowledges, of course, <coughs> that the groundwork laid by Sarger Gaon uh, is essential uh, to the ongoing project of, uh, of thought and of, of Jewish philosophy because he, on the one hand, is the first systematizer of Jewish thought and, on the other hand, 
his emphasis on the compatibility, the compatibility of Torah Judaism with, uh, with reason and with philosophy. So I just wanted to go over, uh, I know that I've gone on a whirlwind uh, through Sa'aj's thought, but I wanted to grasp uh, its essence. Of course, uh, next week I'm going to just maybe uh, fill in some gaps uh, in relation to uh, Neoplatonism and so on, and we're going to just uh, look at a, a kind of a parallel project inside Jewish thought. But the answer to, is there a Jewish rationalist theology? The answer is yes. There are many, many people today, um, some of them even thinkers in the Jewish world, who haven't really progressed beyond Sarja because Sarja's world and Sarja's world view is enough for them. Uh, but we're going to see uh, in the weeks that come that uh, we need more. Uh, and yet Sarja Gaon's contribution to the foundations of, of, of Jewish philosophy are... Uh, are absolutely essential. I thank you for uh, listening to that. I've got a question. I've got a question. So we'll just take one more minute. I've got a question. Um, oh, I see. But, uh, in relation to what I said of the soul. So obviously, uh, it, the question is, which is which? When I said, nefesh, ruach, neshama, which parts of the soul are they? So the nefesh, this, by the way, is an incredibly, incredibly, enduring insight of sages it's amazing the nefesh is the appetitive soul so that's the one that that uh, that breathes that eats that uh, does the things the body does it has its animal lusts and its animal appetites that's the nefesh uh, the ruach is the um emotive or passionate framework of the soul um and uh, neshama is the intellectual one it's the neshama that is going to apprehend the divine uh, whether it is through revelation or through reason and so uh obviously Sarge's book sefer emonot of Vedeot, has been translated to those who want to look at it there are many people who studied Sarge uh, very fruitfully and found a great many things uh, to discuss and talk about but uh, I can't emphasize enough how important that realization about the literality of Torah. Remember that Saji is also fighting the Karaites who were arguing for literal interpretations. Uh, Islam and the whole concept of Quran, the whole concept of literality is surrounding Saja. There are the challenges of coming from philosophy, coming from a great range of, of areas. And so Saja's uh, determination to make the Torah amenable to reason and to philosophy uh, is a contribution of enduring importance. So thank you for listening to that and I hope I will see you as we continue this whirlwind journey uh, next week. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the talk. For episode notes and transcripts or to learn more about David's next classes and projects, visit davidsolomon.online. You can also find David on Instagram or Facebook. Thank you. We hope to see you again soon.